Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is staying cool and out of this heat that we're having. Uh, welcome to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. We're so glad that you're able to join us. My name is Donna Oftenberg, and I am your host and moderator for today. I am located down in Cape Girardeau um, in the southeast part of the state. We have lots of great information, timely information for you today. Um, I, let me get to the state map. And that way can, everybody can see what specialists cover the areas. Um, if your area is vacant, um, look for that next person that might be closest to you. That way you have a person uh, that, that you can contact if you have questions uh, during the summer months or really any time. Uh, presenting today, um, there's Justin Kay from the St. Louis area, Debbie Kelly from East Central, um, Katie Kamler from the East Central also, and then of course me. Um, I already introduced myself. And then from campus, we have Jared Vogue and Pat Ganan, who's going to present the weather. And we have Mandy Bish. Um, Justin has changed his name to ask, uh, ask your questions here. So if any time during today's uh, session you have questions, you can just go over to the chat box and make sure you send it to ask your questions here. Make sure that you put your email address in there. That way, if we run out of time, we have an address to send your the response to, and someone will be in touch with you. We're going to start with the weather report today, and I'm hoping that Pat has some good news for us, but I have a, a bad feeling it maybe not. So Pat, go ahead and take it away. Sounds good, Donna, and thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And indeed, it, it has been a uh, an interesting July, to say the least. We really uh, jumped right into the dog days of summer with these temperatures and, and high, um, high humidities. Well, we're halfway through June. On the left are some of the precipitation totals um, for the first half of the month. And we do start, we are starting to see some dryness emerge across the state, um, especially parts of Southeast Missouri for the first couple of weeks, generally only about a half to one inch. I see even some areas here in Shannon County down into Oregon and Howe County, only a, a tenth to a half inch. And so um, dryness is beginning to emerge. And of course, with these high temperatures, full sunshine, we're seeing really big um, evaporation rates, evapotranspiration rates. I mean, yesterday, the weather stations were indicating with the wind and heat, um, evapotranspiration rates, potential evapotranspiration rates, were running about three tenths of an inch. That is a lot of water getting sucked out of the ground as well as what's transpiring from vegetation. So you really got to hit, hit the irrigation to keep up with water loss uh, of that nature. And that's been ongoing for the past couple of days. Today is going to be no exception. A lot of water loss has taken place. Um, Higher totals across the northern parts of Missouri during the first half of June, a little bit better there. In the precip on the right uh, is a departure from normal map. The greens are above normal precipitation. The, the, the shades of yellows are below normal precip and you can see how the dryness is starting to impact a good portion of the south, oh, southeastern third of the state. A little bit better off with uh, precipitation events uh, across northern and west central Missouri. Current conditions across the state, again, I look at this map and you'd think it was in the middle of the afternoon in July or August, but nope, it's the middle of June and they're already running in the upper 80s. I see at the St. Louis Science Center, 91 degrees of about 10 minutes ago. So this was even before noon. These were the uh, air temperatures running well above average, 10 to easily 10 degrees or so above average. And uh, what's matching that is uh, unusually high dew points. And of course, when you get those high dew points in the 60s, upper 60s, lower 70s, that's downright oppressive. And so we're seeing these heat indices running into the hundreds again um, for today. In the upper left, uh, uh, there are heat advisories and there are actually are excessive heat warnings. These darker shades of pink are indicating heat indices that could approach 105 or higher today. That is not healthy to be out in a, an environment like that for an extended period of time. So please be aware of that. Um, heat advisories also generally across the eastern third of Missouri. Again, these will be heat indices in the triple digits, generally between 100 and 105. 
that also can be very stressful. And so the National Weather Service has some of these warnings ongoing, um, the excessive heat warning for St. Louis area and Southeast Missouri is until 8 p.m. To tomorrow evening. Uh, I got to talk a little bit of encouraging news. Hopefully, at least I got to be somewhat optimistic, but none, uh, there are some chances of some showers and thunderstorms uh, uh, starting, I'd say, late this afternoon into this evening uh, across parts of northern Missouri. That will translate perhaps east and southeastward through, the, through this evening and tonight. They're not the best chances, and I don't really necessarily see a widespread precipitation event, but nonetheless, there will be some scattered showers and thunderstorms. Some of them could be severe because the atmosphere is so unstable. Uh, and so some badly needed rainfall could perhaps fall with these scattered showers and thunderstorms. We'll have an opportunity uh, late today and tonight. And then another one, they're actually what's causing this, there's a cold front that's uh, slowly moving southward into Missouri uh, as I speak, and it's uh, forecasted to, to stall out across somewhere between Northern and Central Missouri for the next day or two. And so there will be another chance of showers and thunderstorms uh, tomorrow afternoon and to tomorrow night. So we do have a couple opportunities, again, not widespread, but nonetheless, some folks will probably see some uh, rainfall, which is good news considering the heat we've been in and, and the dryness over the past few days. Uh, down here are the low and the high temperatures over the next five days. You can see where that cold front, actually some pleasant uh, morning temp early morning temperatures across northern Missouri down into the lower to middle 60s. That'll feel very nice tomorrow morning across northern parts of the state. Areas south of the front will still be muggy with low temperatures only in the low to middle 70s. It's highly unusual to get low temperatures in the mid to upper 70s. Uh, this time of year, any time of year for that matter, but we're we're breaking some records in that regard with these high minimum temperatures. Even some areas in some of the urban areas reported lows of 80 degrees, which is just really unusual in the summertime, let alone the month of the middle part of June. High temperatures tomorrow will again be uncomfortable, generally running 10 degrees above average in the middle 90s for Thursday, and then Friday morning lows, Saturday, Sunday, it's pretty much a broken record with lows in the 70s, lower 70s, uh, maybe some Sunday morning uh, conditions could be a little bit better in the Ozarks with lows in the mid 60s, but rebounding back into the 70s as we go into early next week. And you can see the high temperatures over the next several days. Again, this is more of a latter part of July early August, then middle part of June with temperatures generally in the middle 90s. Unfortunately, look at these uh, temperatures in Northwest Missouri on Sunday and Monday in triple digit category. So indeed it is a, uh, a heat wave that just doesn't wanna let go. And, and I'm really hoping we see a change in this weather pattern. Um, and uh, this is the forecast of precipitation over the next seven days, uh, and not a lot. In fact, the highest likelihood for some decent precip is across the northern half of the state, anywhere from a half to perhaps an inch of precipitation. That will be welcome considering these high evapotranspiration rates that we're seeing, which will dry out the soils quickly. Um, so perhaps the, the, there could be some localized heavier amounts of precip with those thunderstorms that are forecasted for tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, lower chances for any notable precip uh, over the next seven days across the southern half of Missouri. And uh, I hate to be the harbinger of perhaps uh, what appears to be a broken record, at least through next week, but it does indicate a high likelihood of these above normal temperatures to continue into next week. So again, temperatures in the 90s, perhaps even some triple digits across much of the middle part of the country. And then on the right, just insult to injury, is with those high temperatures, they are forecasting below normal uh, precipitation. I, I do wanna add uh, just so, somewhat of a comment that this weather pattern is, is um, starting to be a little bit concerning. On the, on the, Donna mentioned the D word and that's drought. So uh, we're, we're sort of setting the stage as we slip into the latter half of June and into July, but on the plus side, we're actually looking pretty good right now as we slip into slump into the summer, which the, the official first day will be next week. Currently, we do have a decent soil moisture reserve in the, in the subsoils because of the antecedent conditions. 
Uh, surface water supplies are also looking pretty good right now, at least according to the uh, Missouri Ag Statistics Service. They're generally running adequate to even some surplus areas because of the heavier precip we saw back earlier this spring. So we do have a little bit of collateral, and, but that's only going to last for another week or two if these conditions continue. Uh, and so I would say if they do continue over the next cu couple of weeks, things will quickly uh, deteriorate. Um, we will see water stress in lawns and, and, and gardens and pastures and even in the row crops, especially the row crops that are in early stage growth and, and they're still developing their root system. So we really need to keep an eye on this. Hopefully we will see a pattern change. I, I think back of 2016, we had a very hot and dry June in 2016. We had a pattern change in early July and things got a lot better with cooler temperatures and precipitation. Hopefully we'll, we'll see that, we'll just, time will tell. Um, but also at the same time, when we get these patterns that set up this time of year, they do, they can't stick around for the rest of the summer. So, um, and it's not pretty when they do. So hopefully we'll see that pattern change, Donna. And uh, thanks so much for the, uh, uh, let me give a weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. Well, today uh, we have lots of good information for you. Um, we did have a question come in about apple trees being in close proximity to two cedar trees. Um, and they would like to know if it is cedar apple rust and what, what can be done with that. Um, Katie, would you like to answer that? Uh, yes, can you see my screen? Uh, not yet, there it is. Okay. So um, these were the pictures that were submitted and you can see um, the blotching on the leaves and um, pretty severe blotching and yellowing. And then there's also a picture of the entire tree. So um, I knew right away from looking at the pictures that it was not cedar apple rust, which is very common and we do see uh, often, uh, particularly with all the cedars around. Uh, so um, the best guess is black rot or, uh, and or uh, alternaria blotch. So I say best guess because we cannot accurately diagnose disease problems from pictures most of the time. So if you want to know for sure, it needs to be a sample sent to the plant diagnostic clinic and Pong can uh, culture it out and find out for sure. Another comment I would make looking at the picture of the tree is that pruning really makes a huge difference on disease problems because pruning allows air and light flow through that tree. So they dry out quicker and we have less disease problems. And I'm also going to share some other common apple diseases. So apple scab is another common disease that we do see. So you can see spots on the leaves for this one also. And um, in some cases it can start early in the season. You see this little apple um, with the spots on it. And um, that one is probably doomed because it started when it was uh, so small. And then the others, the, the red one, that's more cosmetic. So if you were selling that, probably not uh, uh, very viable, but for a home gardener, you know, you just um, cut that off and peel it, not a big deal. This other apple, you probably still could get some apple out of that. You would have to uh, uh, cut out bigger spots on that one. Uh, the cedar apple uh, rust was the one that, that they were uh, the uh, email was concerned about. These spots are very distinctive. They kind of have halo spots, and a lot of times you can see pink in those spots. And this one has two hosts. So it starts in the springtime on cedar, and you see these uh, jelly-like fingers that are bright orange, so they're pretty noticeable on the cedar. And then those spores move in onto the apples and um, the leaf form. And then there can also be uh, cedar apple rust uh, on the apples themselves. So, uh, and it can get bad enough that those spots join together and the leaves turn yellow and they will defoliate. 
So those are common uh, apple diseases and leaf spots. So um, there are fungicide spray programs to help with those. Uh, but remember uh, pruning and airflow and movement can also be a huge help. Okay, our next question is about unusual fungus or mushrooms growing in a flower bed where there is wood mulch. Uh, Katie, would you also like to take that one? All right, can you see my slides? Yes. All right, so this was one of the first, uh, the pictures submitted. And um, sometimes we call these LBMs, little brown mushrooms. There are lots and lots of brown mushrooms and lots of mushrooms that grow in, in mulch and um, on woody debris. I did some looking, I am not sure what this uh, particular mushroom is, uh, but typically mushrooms in mulch and in the landscape are not a concern. So that was the first mushroom picture. And uh, before we got these pictures, we were all debating amongst ourselves which mushrooms they might be. This was the one that I was guessing. So this is a, the picture that was submitted. You can see this stuff on the, the mulch here. And then I also have some more pictures of the same thing. I love, uh, I get this call commonly. I've got this bright yellow. This one's not as bright as they can be. Uh, stuff on my mulch. And the name of this is actually dog vomit slime mold. So your, your uh, fun take home fact of the day uh, or name of fungus is dog vomit slime mold. So it starts out bright yellow like this, then it, it will dry up and sometimes have these black um, kind of um, dusty parts on top. On mulch, Cosmetic, if it bugs you, you don't like to look at it, just scoop it off and it's not an issue either. And then since, uh, as I said, we were guessing uh, what common mushrooms might uh, be in this question, I included a few more that I commonly get. This is called a stink horn. And um, the stink horn is a good description because it does smell and a lot of times you will see flies on it. And then these, I've always liked these even as a little kid because their name is also very descriptive. These are bird's nest fungi. So uh, raindrops land in those and spread them from that. And we see these on a lot of mulches and even um, twigs and different things. On this side, you can see and there that they are not open yet. And then they open and reveal those eggs. And another common one that we get uh, calls about are fairy rings. Uh, this one was a pretty good ring, except for that oddball in the center. Uh, so this is when it is fruiting. So you actually see the mushroom themselves. But a lot of times you can also see fairy rings um, because there is a ring of grass that is brighter green and taller. And that's where those that fungi is in that edge of that fairy ring. There's one I drive by on my way to work all the time. And um, I rarely see the mushrooms, but I can see that that ring of taller and greener grass. And that's all I have for uh, lawn mushrooms, Donna. Okay, thank you, Katie. So with the extreme heat, uh, we thought that maybe we could talk about safety in the garden. Um, let me get my, my screen shared. Okay, so we're gonna talk about protecting yourself. You know, we're, we're, it's projected to have, our temperature is supposed to be between 100, 105 in the next week and in, in some areas, you could be a little different in the area of your part of the state. But I know in the Southeast region, when they started talking about 103 and 104, maybe close up to 105, I thought, oh, wow, how are we gonna garden in this? Well, the big thing is protect yourself during the heat. Take time to take care of yourself. Think about uh, when you should be gardening. Think about the time of day. 
you know, the temperatures are always going to be cooler or early, earliest in the morning or later in the evening. And so try to avoid the peak time of day where that sun is just blazing hot and, and the temperatures are maxed out. So try to always choose early or late. On clothing, definitely try to always pick lighter cl colored clothes. And I know there's a lot of people out there that I'm friends with in the gardening world that are very sensitive to the sun and they choose to have long sleeve shirts and long pants on. Now I'm hot natured, so it's like, oh, I couldn't stand that. But I still try to take my precautions by covering up a little. Also have a wide brimmed hat, that way you're covering your face really well from the sun. Uh, consider sunglasses to protect your eyes and don't forget that sunscreen. I know there's a lot of people that think, oh, I don't have to worry about the sunscreen. I tan really well. Be careful. Still take those precautions uh, that, you know, SPF 45 or above is what, uh, what they recommend. More is better in terms of that number. The greater the number, the greater the protection. So don't forget to use that sunscreen my slide to go. There we go. The other suggestion I have is uh, work smarter. Um, brief tasks. Don't spend an hour on something. Try to limit your time to outdoors, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then try to take a break. Pace yourself. I know my, my mother's uh, biggest comment has always been about me that I go everything gangbusters, fast, hard, you know, trying to get it done in, in, in a timely manner. Well, I'm bad about not pacing myself. And so the other day when it was starting to get really hot, I kept telling myself in the back of my head, slow down, slow down, pace yourself, take it easy. And that is my advice for anybody. Switch tasks often, and that way your muscles don't fatigue, your muscles, um, you know, our bodies don't work as well in this high heat. So just give it a break. Um, take breaks, and I can't emphasize that, emphasize that enough. Um, 15 minutes, take a break. And you don't have to go inside. I know a lot of people say, well, I don't want to go indoors because that's going to spoil me just find you a shade tree or step inside the garage if it's cooler or somewhere where you can just take a break. It doesn't always mean that you have to go indoors, but take it slow, take a break, hydrate. Most of us do not drink enough water, especially when we get outside and we get going, we don't want to take that break and take that and go inside and get a drink. If you don't want to do that, take a jug with you, ice it down, or get a bottle that's insulated, ice it down, and that way you have something nice and cool. Uh, I do know there's a lot of people that don't like a lot of ice. It's okay. If they want to drink lukewarm water, that's great. If they want to drink cool water, just the main focus is hydrate. And if you don't like water, flavor it. Um, and know when to quit. I know this is one thing I have had to learn um, because I just get so hot. I don't deal well with the heat. So I have to know when to quit. And that's where I go back to setting those time limits. So I know that, hey, I need to take that 10 minute break. Know what signs there are for heat stress and heat exhaustion. Uh, know your body and listen to what it tells you. Uh, definitely. If you get out there and in 10 minutes you're lightheaded and you're feeling pretty weak, take a break, get inside. Don't risk it. If nauseous, um, headache, confusion, you know, think about maybe taking a longer break. And then, of course, if you start having problems with the muscle cramps, excess sweating, irritability, it might be time to start thinking, well, do I need to contact someone, tell them that I'm not doing so hot? That way they can check on me. And remember, it doesn't take much to go from heat exhaustion to heat stroke. And the image to the right um, it just sort of gives you an idea when you quit sweating, when you start noticing that your skin is hot and dry, Start thinking about getting some help and that way you do not um, lose consciousness and you're beyond help. So definitely take care of yourself. Now, let's switch gears. Let's talk about plants. The biggest thing in protecting our plants from the extreme heat is water wisely. We always try to encourage water seldom, but water thoroughly. You know, uh, Pat talked about the evacuo transpiration loss being three quarters of an inch. That is a lot. So we really need to take a look at our watering. Keep an eye on those plants, especially the ones you hold near and dear to your heart. Um, 
but once again, water seldom but thoroughly. And if that means going out and spending 30 minutes watering one day every two or three days, it's better than watering a little bit each day. What happens when we water a little bit each day is one, it could be all running off and not absorbing in, or it can be creating a situation where plants are going to start root rotting because it's actually too much water. Um, I know a lot of people say, but it's wilting. Well, wilting, yes, it can be a sign of too dry, but it can also be a sign of overwatering where the roots have, have deteriorated so much they can't pick up that moisture, but the plant is still wet. And so that's one thing I always try to tell people is figure out or learn what dry means or what it looks like. You know, lifting on a pot, is it lightweight or is it heavy? Let me stick my finger in the soil and, and dig around you know, try to look at the soil. Is it dark brown indicating that, you know, almost black, that it's indicating wet or is it a light brown? Um, so learn in your garden and in your microclimates what that dry means and what it looks like, because sometimes it's, it does not look or feel the same across the board. Um, it's always best to try to have a direct placement of water, which means that you're putting the water next to that root system or right there at the base of the plant. Uh, we can do a lot of damage when we're doing aerial watering or overhead watering. And so really we like to see people place it at the ground level. And so we look at drip emitters, we look at soaker hoses. I love soaker hoses because you can walk around way 15, 20 minutes, depending on your water pressure, you can have a pretty good soaking. Um, if you link too many together, it may take you up to two hours to water. Just remember, it depends on that water pressure and it depends on how long you make those links of, of hoses. Um, it, it's not completely bad if you do the aerial or the overhead watering. If that's all you got, then, then do it. Just remember to do it early enough in the evening that your foliage is going to dry because you don't want to put your foliage away wet. Uh, you don't want to put the plants to bed wet. Um, so think about that timing on the watering, because usually what we try to encourage is early morning or later in the evening. Um, and there are lots of di different uh, tips and techniques out there online for watering. I know people that poke holes in milk jugs, they use PVC pipes, shove down in the ground, lots of different ways to slow that watering down so it actually absorbs into the soil. Um, I know I've been um, known to take a five gallon bucket poke a couple holes in the bottom, and then set those holes to the base of the plant, fill it halfway up. And then that way the water drips out or trickles out very slowly. And the big thing is we don't want the runoff. We want that water to actually soak in. And think about those plants' water needs. Their different plants have different needs. And so you may not be able to water things across the board. I know I have two planters out in front of my office. One is drying out every day. The other is staying wet uh, every, and it only needs to be watered every three to four days. So it's good to notice those differences because even in the ground, even with the different plant species, vegetables versus flowers versus trees, everything um, is, has a different need. Add a layer of mulch, three to four inches of mulch can really do a lot of good for plants. Just don't add it when it's bone dry. You want to make sure things are watered and then add the mulch. So then it conserves that moisture and it can regulate those temperatures because it has enough moisture in the ground. And the other thing I love is it prevents the weeds. Um, organic choices are always best, but mulch with whatever you have. I've even been known as taking large um, sheets of cardboard and putting them down on the ground, blocking them down. And that way there's not as much transpiration loss coming out of that, that ground. Um, think about um, hardwood bark, pine needle, straw, leaves, shredded paper, any of that stuff, grass clippings can work as a mulch. So you don't necessarily have to uh, buy things, but just look around and see what you have available. Um, also, if you notice that your plants are, are starting to stress really well, you might consider shading those young plants. Uh, I know I have master gardeners that use old umbrellas, um, shade cloth. Um, they can go get the shade cloth like what you would put on a dog kennel and they drape it over um, some cage wire or some hoops. You can use arbors, trellises, benches. If you have a couple garden benches, just slip them over the plants that are starting to have trouble for that little bit of shade that it might prevent, uh, provide. 
Um, also think about row covers. It's that white uh, light spun bound material that they use to keep insects off of our plants. Well, it can also help with shading. So you can find that a lot, a lot of different uh, garden centers and nurseries. So just buying a couple packages of those might also help. And if you don't want to go invest a lot of money, then you can actually use light colored sheets also. The big, uh, the big whole point of this is trying to get a little bit of shade to relieve those plants because they do stress when those temperatures get so high. And other tips I might just mention is Caution when weeding, because anytime you weed, you're disrupting the soil. Anytime you're disrupting the soil, you are uh, providing opportunity for more evaporational loss. And so just keep that in mind. I'm not saying don't weed, just find a different method of weeding other than cultivating the ground. Um, fertilize when moist. If we're in a dry period and you haven't watered in a while, do not add fertilizer because those plants will be injured. And so always fertilize when moist. If something is wilted, do not fertilize it. Very important. And then of course, moisten the soil prior to any seeding that you might do by a couple of days. And that way you have plenty of ground moisture to get those seeds up out of the ground. And of course, when, if you're doing any seeding, make sure to put a thin layer of mulch or straw over the seeds. And I'm even knowing people to take a uh, board and put over the seed for a couple of days to get it to ger start to germinate. And then they pull that board off. So lots of different tips and, and good information on how to keep us uh, more comfortable as well as the plants. Okay, let me stop sharing. All right, so um, our next topic is um, how does the heat affect our tomatoes? Justin, do you want to take that question? Sure, just one second here, get my PowerPoint pulled up. All right, um, so this time of year, there can be a couple problems um, associated with tomatoes and heat. Uh, one is that the plants have tons of flowers, but the fruit won't set. So we've been kind of trapped in this hot period. We're gonna be trapped in this hot period for uh, the foreseeable future, according to Pat's forecast. Um, but what's going on here is, is the blossoms are dropping before the fruit before the fruit sets. Um, this is related to the physiology of the tomato and the environment. So the plant has basically just hit its limit physiologically in terms of what it can do under the current environmental conditions. Uh, these blossoms will become brittle and fall off of the plant. And you might notice that on, on some of your tomato plants over this, this hot period that we're in. So what's going on here, once the daytime temperatures are above 90 and nighttime temps are above 72, um, and this varies a little bit with, within tomato varieties, but this blossom drop begins happening and this aborting of fruits. So what's going on here? Um, tomato flowers need to be pollinated within about 50 hours or they will drop. And this is about the amount of time that it takes for the pollen to get down the style into the ovary. So if you take a look at this image here, I've highlighted in red, um, the, the, stig the stigma is where the pollen enters and it travels down the style into the ovary. And so basically it, at these high temperatures, that process does, does not happen effectively. Um, the pollen becomes sticky, it becomes non-viable, and so it's unable to pollinate the flower within that 50-hour time period. So unfortunately, we can't control the weather. Um, this is something that with, with most tomato varieties, we're just going to have to wait for the, for the weather to, uh, to cool down. Um, cherry tomatoes, do have a better ability to maintain fruit set at higher temperatures. So um, if you don't have any cherry tomatoes this year, that might be something you want to plant next year to avoid some of these issues with, with fruit set and, and abort. Just keep your tomatoes well irrigated um, during this time period of extreme heat. 
and they will begin setting fruit again as, as temperatures fall. You might also notice this with green beans. Um, they are also susceptible to aborting fruit with this the hot weather. Another issue that folks are reporting across the state and that we see this uh, during these hot periods as well is that tomatoes just won't ripen. They just won't turn red. They're on the vine, but they just won't come to that great tasty uh, mature color and flavor. So above 85 degrees, tomatoes begin slowing down, um, ripening, and you know we have high daytime temperatures and high nighttime temperatures. This ripening process really begins to slow down. In extended periods of extreme heat, the tomatoes will just stall out altogether and ripening will just completely stop. The fruit may stop ripening at that yellow green stage or it may appeal pure yellowish orange and it it just won't turn red and it may end up you know falling off the vine or um or rotting on the vine so tomatoes go through several different stages of maturation um, the early stage involves that fruit getting up to that mature green size and then optimal ripening D doesn't occur to 68 and 77 degrees. So at these high temperatures, tomatoes basically stop producing the compounds that are responsible for the color of tomatoes, which are lycopene and carotene. So with this one, we just need to wait for the temperatures to drop and we might need to just compost uh, a bunch of those tomatoes that got frozen in that ripening stage. Um, I just put this picture on here, there is some research that's starting to come out that using shade cloth on tomatoes can help prevent both fruit abortion and these ripening disorders. So a 30% shade cloth, Donna mentioned the shade cloth in her last presentation, uh, but that 30% shade cloth is what was used in this uh, experiment in Maryland. And you can see visibly there that the quality of the tomatoes uh, is much greater and it reduced a lot of the fruit set problems as well as the fruit ripening problems. So that's all I got on that one. Okay, thank you, Justin. So we have some pictures come in of peony leaves with spots. So Debbie, you wanna take that one? Sure, I'm happy to do so. So this past week, um, we at my master gardener class on Monday night and Katie was there. She was helping to teach. So uh, she showed us these pictures and I was like, huh, I wonder what that is. And Katie immediately said what the answer was. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize that. So even those of us that, you know, are knowledgeable and educated in horticulture still don't know all the answers. So I'm glad Katie was with me so she could help. So thank you, Katie, for that. So these are the pictures that came in and it is, I call it a peony, some call it peony, whatever your choice might be. Um, and these were the pictures and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So what is this really? Is this a disease or is this an insect? And so the answer is it's called the four lined plant bug is what the, is causing this damage. It is not a disease. I had never heard of the four-line plant bug, so I, that caught me off guard. So this is the adult. You can see it in the picture here, and it actually does have those four lines that go across, so it's very identifiable. It's kind of a really cool, interesting-looking insect as an adult. And then as a nymph or as a young stage, it actually can be a bright red, and it also could be a bright yellow, according to the information that I looked up. Uh, so I could present this to you because I wanted to learn about this since I had I wasn't familiar with this insect. It likes to feed on over 250 types of species. However, it prefers these types of plants that I have listed up here. And I've underlined two in particular, the mint and the aster family. As I was looking at all this information, mint kept coming up over and over again, as well as any type of a flower or plant that's in the aster family. But I thought it was really interesting to see the variety of different plants that it can it can be on. Also, what Katie had said when she talked about it the other evening with me is she said, you just can't see them. So you don't know, you have to identify from the damage to start with. 
So what is the life cycle? The life cycle is, is that they hatch as eggs and emerge in early spring as nymphs. They feed on the underside of the leaves for about four months before they molt into the adults. And then again, because they feed on the underside of the leaves, that's why we don't necessarily see them on an ongoing basis when we look. So when you're scouting through your garden, make sure that you don't only look at just the top, but turn some leaves over, see what it looks like on the bottom. And we always like to tell folks, if you send pictures, send pictures of the top of the leaves as well as the bottom of the leaves, as well as the full plant so we can see it. Adults like to feed from early, uh, from when they molt until early July, and then they mate. Once they mate, they lay their eggs and then they die. Their eggs are laying as a banana-shaped egg, usually in slits in the actual stems of the plant themselves. And there's usually only one generation per year. So let's, now that we know that, let's talk about the damage. They usually have dark, round, sunken spots, slightly sunken, on leaves that are generally, the spots are uniform on the leaves. The spots after a while can become kind of clear looking and they can even drop out. And so it looks like you've got holes. It can be mistaken for a leaf disease. However, the spots are not uniform if it is a disease versus if it's damage from the four lined insect or plant bug. The leaves can also turn completely brown and that can actually sever off of the plant and fall to the ground if there's a severe damage. And feeding on new growth will actually almost appear as if it's wilting when it may not be wilting. It's just that, that what this insect does is it, it sucks all the sap, the liquid out of, those, out of the plant, out of that growing tip. And so of course it's gonna look like it's being wilted. So here is some damage and what it actually can look like. And here you can see the, the young nymph. Notice this is the underside of the leaf and the, how they're scraping off and sucking out the juices. Here is the top side of what the leaf would look like. So on the bottom, it almost looks a little silvery or a little tannish. On the, uh, on the top side, it's actually going to look more brown. And the more that they do in circles, the more the circles can actually kind of come together. So then when we look at this to see if it's actually going to be insect damage or a disease damage, the top leaf here is actually damaged from the four line plant bug. And you can see how they're more or less kind of uniform in nature. They kind of appear to be slightly sunken into the leaf. The bottom leaf is actually septoria leaf spot you can notice that the coloration is slightly different. Notice that the spots on the diseased leaf are not totally circular. They're kind of odd shaped as well. And they, they're different kinds of shapes on each of those different spots. Whereas the damaged leaf from the insect actually are pretty more uniform than what is on the diseased. So how can we control? You can mechanically, you can hand remove them except they move really, really quickly. So you'll have to turn those leaves over and when you see them, chances are they're already gonna start moving. A, a water stream hard enough to remove them from the underside of the leaf can help to dislodge them and push them onto the ground. And then it's gonna take them a while to kind of crawl back up on that plant. So it helps to prevent as much damage. Cultural control, remember they lay their eggs in July-ish, towards the end of July, in slits on the stem of the plant itself. So at the end of the growing season, go ahead and remove all of the stems from those plants if you do have this insect in the garden. You can also plant what we call a trap crop. And a trap crop is going to be set off a little bit from the plants that you want to keep. But the trap crop then is kind of like, for me, I love ice cream. I'd have that over anything, eat that before anything else. If you put it on the table, I'll go for the ice cream first. And so the four-lined plant bug will go after a mint 
plant before it will actually go to the crops that you might have or the plants or flowers that you have in your gardens. Mint can become very invasive. It spreads really easily. So you might wanna put some pots out instead of putting it directly into the ground. As far as biological control, it's not well studied. We don't know of any invasive insect that might be out there, or I'm sorry, um, a, a insect that goes after and feeds on this particular insect. Um, chemical control is generally not recommended. And the main reason for that is just really, it just is more of a cosmetic type of an issue unless you have a huge infestation of these insects. And that's all I have for this particular insect. So keep a lookout for it in your garden areas. Thank you, hey, Debbie. Hey, Donna, we had a question come in. I was gonna ask that here if that's all right. Okay, let's go for it. Sure. So the question is, just to make sure I got it, if will black rot kill the apple tree other than pruning, cutting out dead limbs to make a healthier tree, during drop leaves or raked up, cutting out dead limbs and dispose of properly, would a fungicide before it buds next season be a good idea? So um, the reality is that most of our diseases in our fruit trees aren't diseases that are actually going to kill the tree. However, they are all stresses to the trees. Um, so, you know, year after year, stresses can add up along with environmental conditions. So um, that sanitation, pruning, cleaning up, all of those are very important uh, to help uh, prevent diseases and remove diseases. And then following a spray schedule in order to prevent that. Off the top of my head, I don't know what the spray schedule is for that particular disease as far as timing goes. And uh, just remember that that was our best guess based on those leaf spots. We don't actually know for sure what exactly the particular disease is. And uh, you go from there and um, those uh, preventative fungicide spray programs are important in, in fruit trees here in Missouri because of the high humidity that we have during the summer. Uh, leads to more disease problems. And hope I answered the question that you asked. And if you have more, please let me know and we can follow up some more. Okay, so next Justin is going to share with us some summer tasks um, that you can be doing in the vegetable garden. All right, um, I just wanted to real quickly highlight a couple things that you might want to consider um, about planting. And I know it's a weird time of year to think about planting, uh, but there's some opportunities that you might not want to miss out on. And it's easy to, to miss those opportunities when you're in the heat of the summer gardening season. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, fall vegetables as well as some summer plantings, uh, mid summer, pl summer plantings. And if you haven't seen this document before, this is the MU vegetable planting calendar. It's really great, just a three to four page document. It talks about planting dates. It's broken up by region for South Central and North Missouri. It talks about things like spacing, as well as seeding depth, um, things like days from planting to harvest, whether things should be transplanted or direct season. There's a lot of, a lot of suggestions on varieties, as well as some information on tomato plant disease resistant, resistance. So, uh, a couple things you might want to consider in terms of plants to start um, for, for fall harvest. So some of our plants like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage, uh, we want to get those started soon because we're going to want to plant those um, sometime in mid-July to maybe early August, depending on the part of the state that you're in. Um, with these plants, we wanna shoot for healthy four to six week old transplants. And the germination on these crops is between 70 and 80. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're planting these and cell trays that are in a, a somewhat cooler cool area. And you wanna consider days to maturity. You might wanna have some shorter days to maturity options, um, but these crops are all, all cool, cold hardy. Um, and if you haven't ever tried these crops as fall crops, I do encourage you to give them a try. Um, when these are up, when broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage are planted as spring crops, 
um, they tend to mature in some of the hotter weather we have here in Missouri. So as fall planted crops, they have a little bit sweeter flavor um, and they, they just really grow well towards the end of the season as those nighttime temperatures drop and, and they really just get to growing. So it's, it's a little bit different fall of wax than planting them in the spring, um, but a lot of fun. And it's, it's really great to have these for harvest later in the fall um, when you might not normally have them. Another thing you might want to consider um, planting now is, is sweet corn. Um, so we can plant this through um, July and even into August in some parts of the state. Um, when you're planting sweet corn, you always want to plant it in blocks to get appropriate pollination as opposed in, to long rows. Um, you're going to get much better pollinated corn if it is planted in, in blocks. Um, there are some pest challenges with this one. Um, two of the most common pests we encounter are the corn earworm and the European corn borer. Um, the corn earworm, this is the one that enters through the top of the ear. And this is just one image of it. This, this caterpillar um, can look a number of different colors. Um, and then the corn borer is the one that actually enters through the side of the ear, through the, the leaves on the, the shell of the ear corn there. And these are both laid by moths. Um, they're laid as eggs, and then those eggs develop through different stages of maturity, and then they enter into the, the ear of corn to consume it. So there's a bunch of different insecticide options for, for both of these. Um, I just wanted to list some of the non-toxic options. Um, there's a good SARE publication on organic corn, uh, sweet corn production. But the two, two items that you can use to control these are either corn or soybean oil and Bt. And Bt is a commonly available um, insecticide. It's a bacterium, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. And so when these caterpillars consume that bacterium, it essentially um, explodes their, their innards. So kills them from the inside out. And it's non-toxic to humans and to pets. So with the corn earworm, the one that, that enters at the top of the, the ear of the sweet corn, um, you can apply a mixture of one of these oils as well as BT. Um, you don't need much to apply to the base of the silks. And you wanna to apply to the base of the silks when, when browning of the silks has occurred. Otherwise you might, you could affect the pollination of the sweet corn. And you're gonna to need to apply that to the top of, of each ear of corn. Uh, with this oil combination, it's less likely to wash off in, in heavy rains. Um, BT can wash off in rains, but with this oil combination, it'll stick around for a lot longer. With the European corn borer, BT is, is what we're going to use, and that's going to be sprayed on, on the corn leaves, on the outside of the ear of corn. Um, it's, it is recommended if you're using BT to use it with a sticker spreader. Uh, this is something that you mix in a sprayer tank or a backpack sprayer or a pump sprayer that basically helps whatever solution you have in there adhere. Um, it helps it mix well and then adhere to whatever surface that it's applied on. You're going to want to apply BT at tassel emergence, um, but before silking, and then you're going to want to scout for damage and you, you would want to spray one week later. Um, if there is widespread damage you occurred. Heavy rains can wash off BT products, so just keep that in mind. Um, after, if you apply this stuff and you have a heavy rain, you might need to go ahead and apply it again. Okay, thank you, Justin. So um, next is horticulture terminology. So Debbie? Yeah, so um, go ahead and I'm going to try to see if I can get the poll to work this time. Okay, I'm not seeing the poll. Can someone else, uh, Jared, can you run that poll, please? Um, so the term for this week is going to be pundicle, the location where all grass blades meet at one point, a stalk of inflorescence, the tip growing tip of a new stem or branch of a tree. 
And so if you could go ahead and mark everything, select A, B, or C as far as what you think it might be. Got some answers coming in. I'll give you another 10 seconds. All righty, I'm gonna end the poll and share your results. So 50% of you say A, which is the location where all grass blades come together at one point. 12% of you say a stalk of an inflorescence, and inflorescence is the flower. And 38% of you say the growing tip of a new, I have to move this, I don't remember all my answers, of a new stem or branch of a tree. The correct answer is, a stem-like connecting part of a plant. So it actually is the part that holds the inflorescence up. So you can see here, it says PED because there wasn't enough space, but the pendicle is right here. And then we actually have the top pendicle diameter and you can almost see a little bit of difference right here between the two, but the actual pendicle is going to be the part of the stem of the flower that holds that flower up. And so that is your term for today. And so with a leaf, we call it a petiole, but when it's a, a, a blade or a, rather a stem for a flower, it's called a pendicle. Good job, everyone. Okay, so Justin, do we have any more questions that came in? Um, we, we just had one question that came in about uh, a sticker. What is a sticker spreader? And I'll answer that one. A sticker spreader, that's kind of like a common term for um, what's known as an adjuvant, um, which is basically something that's mixed into a pesticide spray solution to either help the pesticide mix better with water and or help it stick to and adhere to the plant better. So we have a couple of minutes. Any more questions? Um, you know, you might want to uh, shoot them to ask your questions here. We'll give you a few moments. Donna, if it's okay, I would just like to, to let folks know that we um, have the option of you submitting pictures to us through uh, the sign up. So you have to sign up again. And what's really cool is that some of you are really starting to use that new feature and it helps us to answer some of your questions because a lot of times, you know, I had someone who called and had uh, yellowing of their pepper plant leaves and they were, didn't have access. I asked for a picture and they didn't have access of being able to send a picture to me. So it was really hard for me to try to define what that particular issue could have been. And we were just kind of guessing at the potential of what it is. So um, just wanted to have that out there so folks know that we really do like having your pictures sent in with your questions. I, I did have one that came in here, Donna. Um, how do you, where do you send a plant sample? Um, let me just drop that in the chat box again. I had a couple people ask about that. So we have an MU plant disease diagnostic clinic on campus. And so um, I'm gonna drop that in the chat box again. There's a great website um, where you can submit samples of pictures as well as instructions on how to send uh, your plant material to the lab. And if you have questions about what to send, um, definitely reach out to your local horticulturist or to the plant diagnostic clinic to make sure that you're sending the specific plant part that's needed. For instance, um, the top of the plant might look diseased, but it might be important to have root material as well. Um, so, but you can definitely, you can upload pictures and you can do all that online now. So um, really handy website there. I just dropped in the chat if anybody wants to take a look. And then Great, Donna, I'm sorry. And Donna, I had a question come to me directly. And I think maybe you're probably the best person to talk about it because I think it reflects back to your conversation. What is the best shade cloth? Well, anything could be perceived as a shade cloth. Um, the ones that you, we normally refer to as shade cloth is a black mesh or a green mesh material that you can either buy from garden centers or horticulture companies. But there are um, some, some that have been buying them from like Harbor Freight and 
I think from Walmart and Lowe's, some of the different retailers that is actually for dog pens. Now it's a little bit heavier shade than what probably you want for a plant. But when we're talking about this high heat, it was probably, it's probably better than nothing. Um, I really like the idea of the, um, the row covers or what we call the insect barriers because they are such a light uh, white bound material that they don't weigh a plant down. And so you have to be careful when you're using these shade cloths, because if it's, if they're fragile plants, you've got to have a way of, of putting a cage over so the, the, the um, shade cloth won't come down and, and break stems and such. And so I would just take a look at some of the local vendors. Um, and, and if not, you might try looking online for those. Okay, so if that is all, let me get my uh, slides back up. So um, we covered a lot of good material today. You know, with this heat, it's always good to review uh, what needs to be done and why plants are acting like they are. And so just uh, be prepared to uh, come and join us again next week. And uh, we will, should have a lot more information and hopefully the weather will be looking a lot better. Remember that if you have questions, you need to go back to the original website and register to the registration form, and you should be able to ask the question there as well as submit pictures as Debbie was talking about. Um, and also, just as a reminder, all these are recorded and put on the YouTube page, the MUIPM webpage. Um, and so just go to YouTube and on the search bar, type in MUIPM and it should pop that up and you can rewatch previous um, uh, snippets. You can watch previous episodes. And so uh, just feel free to uh, renew uh, or review a lot of the information and rewatch things. And so just uh, remember noon on the next uh, several Wednesdays, come back and join us. And if you have any questions in the meantime, reach out to one of us and we will be more than happy to uh, help you. And so I hope everybody stays cool and enjoy the rest of your day.